Hello, and welcome to a new episode of A Flatpack History of Sweden. I'm Chris. And I'm Elsa. We've arrived at episode 23, Olof Hörtkonung, the first Swedish king. Uh, our eagle-eyed listeners might spot that the title is very similar to last episode's, just different punctuation. In the last episode, we talked about how Erik Segosjärl might have been the first king of Sweden, with a question mark, and well, this week's episode is very much a sequel and runs along a similar theme. Was his son, Olof Sjöldkonung, actually the first Swedish king? King with an exclamation mark. Yeah, so that implies that he is, and we'll see throughout this episode about why we have decided that he is. And if you haven't already, we suggest you do listen to last week's episode to get a bit of the context and background to what we'll be talking about today, and hear us essentially decide that Erik Segesel, the father of Olof Hortkonung, was not the first Swedish king, but his son is. Definitely, because the idea today is that we pick up pretty much exactly where we left off last week and continue this discussion. But before we get going with that, how about we do this week's Swedish phrase? Yep, and you've got this one ready for us. Yes, this week's phrase is gredde på moset, often used in the sentence det var gredet på moset. So in English that would be whipped cream on the mash, or in full, that was the whipped cream on the mash. So do Swedes often eat whipped cream on their mashed potatoes? I haven't had that before, so should I expect it at some sort of work <laughs> event? No, I don't think you have to worry about that. Uh, not at all. This phrase actually has a pretty direct equivalent in English. In English, we say that was the cherry on the cake or the icing on the cake, meaning it was the finishing touch, that little bit extra on something that's already good, that makes it even better. Why we instead in Swedish say whipped cream on mashed potato, I, I have no idea. My only guess is that it's two things that have sort of the same consistency. So you already have mash, which is kind of fluffy, and then you add whipped cream, which is also fluffy, but I'm not sure really at all why instead of a cherry on top, it's whipped cream on mash. No, but again, like the phrase last week, it's one of those phrases that becomes quite weird and funny when you translate it to English. Um, it's funnier to say whipped cream on mash than cherry on top. Do you know when this started to become a thing? No, not really. It's something that's always sort of been around for as far as I can remember. Sure. Well, shall we get started on the topic of the day? We shall indeed. The man, the king, Olof Hörtkonung. Whilst we're not a biography podcast, we are a historical podcast and we're trying to go chronologically through Swedish history, naturally we'll arrive at points where there will pretty much be biographical episodes because one person is so important to the story that we'll have to cover their life in full to give you the full context of what's going on. So we're starting where we left off last week with our second biography episode in a row. And we saw last week that Eric Sergesel, Eric the Victorious, was the man who used to sometimes get credit as being the first Swedish king, or who was at least the first person to rule a larger, slightly more consolidated area of Sweden. He died in 994 or 995, and that's when his son, our man of the week, Olaf Hörtkonung, takes over. Exactly. So Olaf Hörtkonung rules from 994 or 995, but his story obviously starts before then. He's born around 980, so he's in his teens when he becomes king. We don't know where he was born. In fact, we don't know much about his early life at all. We know he was co-ruler with his father during the last years of his reign, so he's already quite established by the time he takes over properly, even if he is only, yeah, 15 years old. As we saw at the end of last week's episode, there's some confusion regarding who his mother was. It was either Sigrid the Haughty, a famous Viking woman, who was potentially the daughter of an influential figure in Swedish politics, or his mother was a Slavic princess who might have been called Gunnild, and they've got lots of different backgrounds and potential versions of their life story, so definitely give last week's episode uh, a re-listen if you're a bit confused about what we're talking about there. 
It should be noted that Sweden wasn't a hereditary monarchy at this time, meaning it wasn't certain that just because your dad had been king, you got to be king after him. They're kind of making up the rules as they go because these are the first ones as well. Exactly. I mean, for several centuries to come, Sweden will have a sort of elected monarchy system. But influential families did try to make sure that the power and the crown stayed with them. So Erik Segosel had cemented a power that was strong enough for his son to take over when he died. This was likely a result of a number of alliances, political alliances, that Erik Segosel had made with nobles, in, particularly in western Sweden. Olof Hörtkonung in turn cemented his place in Swedish history by being the first to do two things. One is to make coins, and the second is to be the first properly Christian king. And we'll talk much more about both of these things later on in the episode, but first we should remember that Olaf, like his dad, was very much in the mould of a Viking era ruler. And what did they like to do at the time? Fight battles. Indeed, fight battles. And they did these to maintain or create their power in new areas. And Olaf was not afraid to go into battle, we'll see that right now, because there's one battle that happens early on in his reign, and it's become the battle that he's most known for, and that's the Battle of Svolder. And the Battle of Svolder is a naval battle that takes place in September in either 999 or 1000. Wow, can we take a moment just to say that we've reached the year 1000? That's, that's a pretty cool year, 1000. Yeah, we've come quite a long way since the Stone Ages, uh, when we first started the chronological narrative of Swedish history, but we've still got over a thousand years to go, so I'm looking forward to the next thousand years. Definitely. But before we go into the battle itself, there's a fair bit of context that we need to go over first to find out why these people are fighting and who is fighting. And a lot of it we did touch on in the last episode, so hopefully it shouldn't be too difficult to follow. And if you can remember in the last episode, Erik Segesel, Olaf Wordkong's dad, had an arch enemy, and that was Denmark and the Danish ruler Sven Forkbeard, or Sven Tverhweg, as he's known in Swedish. Yes, well, Olaf seems to have gotten along much better with his dad's old enemy. Adam of Bremen writes that the two get along well, mainly because Adam is also the one that suggests that Sven Forkbeard marries Erik Segosel's widow, Sigrid the Haughty. So if that's the case, Sven would be Ulof Hörtkonung's stepdad. And as we know, family relationships are a great source of military and political alliance at this time. Meanwhile, during Erik Segosel's reign, there was further drama in Norway. Remember how last time we mentioned that King Harold Greatcloak was murdered by the allies of his enemy and predecessor, and that the son of one of these allies was put on the throne of Norway, backed by Harold Bluetooth? This puppet king was called Håkon Sigurdsson, and he ruled from about 975 until the year that Hrödkonung becomes king in Sweden in 995. During this time, the Norwegian king has broken the alliance and the puppet status that Norway had with Harald Bluetooth down in Denmark, so Norway is now fully independent once more. However, Håkon is then removed in a bloody coup by another Viking called Olof Tryggvason, a descendant of another previous Norwegian king, Harald Fairhair. Now, Håkon Sigurdsson's two sons escape to Sweden, and they seek protection from Hörkonung after the coup. One of these sons is called Erik Håkonsson, and he has a huge part to play in this coming battle. He has the status of an earl, and he allied himself with Hörkonung, and then also Sven Forkbeard, by marrying his daughter. Okay, so things aren't looking too good for Olaf Tryggvason. He's removed Eric's father in a bloody coup and is also ruling an independent Norway that Sven will want to take back. In the meantime, Olof Hrödkonung is having good relations with Sven because his mother is now married to Sven. This is a lovely mix of just blood, marriage and convenience. It's, it's like a Viking time soap opera. 
Either way, at the Battle of Svolder, these three men join forces to fight their common enemy, the Norwegian king, Olof Tryggvason. Well, it's a well-known fact throughout history that nothing unites people more than a common enemy. For sure, and Olof and Sven Forkbeard must have realised that they had much more to gain by joining forces against Tryggvason, since they were both interested in taking back control of Norway or gaining influence there. That's before you take into account any of the marriage or family connections. If we agree that Sigrid the Haughty existed and was the mother of Olof Skjöldkjönung, then there is even more reason for this animosity with Tryggvason. Because before marrying Sven Forkbeard, Sigrid supposedly received a proposal from Olof Tryggvason. And to cut a long story short, after Sigrid refused him, Olof got so angry he shouted, why would I want you, you heathen dog? And, and slapped her with his glove in her face. To which she responds, This slap will be your death. Which, in a way, it sort of becomes. Because Sigrid naturally uses her influence with her son and her new husband to convince them to go into battle against Tryggvason. Again, we mentioned this story briefly in the last episode. So now Sigrid gets to get her own back at this rude Olof Tryggvason. Now, there's something that I find fascinating and, well, fun about the Battle of Svolda. What's that? Well, there's no point in trying to look up Svolda on a map because no one knows where it is. We know that it's a naval battle, so it would take place at sea, but no one knows where. We can't find it anywhere. Some sources suggest that it would have been in the Straits of Öresund between modern-day Sweden and Denmark, possibly outside the town of Helsingborg. Others suggest that it takes place much further south, near the island of Rügen, an area that's today Germany. That is interesting, and a lot of battles throughout history, we don't know the very exact location, but we sort of know it's probably somewhere in this field or in this valley or near this mountain, but here we don't even really know that. <laughs> Could be anywhere in the Baltic Sea. But luckily, we know a bit more than that about the battle, or at least what the saga writers thought happened, because there's a lot of information in sagas like the Heimskringler that we're able to read and relate to you. So it turns out that Olaf Tryggvason had actually been out in the east of the Baltic, raiding and trying to expand Norway's influence around the east of the Baltic Sea. On his way back to his homeland, he was ambushed at sea by the combined navies of the three allies Sven Forkbeard, Erik Håkonsson and Olaf Hörtkonung. Olaf Tryggvason, according to the Heimskringler, decides to stay and fight instead of flee, saying, Lower the sail, let not my men think of fleeing, I have never fled in battle, may God dispose of my life, but I shall never flee. And so the battle begins. Ooh. The boats in Olaf Tryggvason's fleet had some great names. His flagship, if we can call it that, is called the Serpent. And then there were other boats called the Large Serpent and the Small Serpent and uh, yeah, reptilian names. But getting back to the battle, Sven Forkbeard attacked first before being repelled. He had to escape out of arrow range after losing many men and a few ships. Hurt Kjönung then took his place, but also, quote, fared like the others, losing many men and some ships, and so retired from the fight. Erik Håkonsson, the third one, then started a different tactic, attacking the outer ships of the Norwegian king, taking them one by one until only the serpent was left. Sven Forkbeard and Olof Hörtkjönung then returned to the battle with the Heimskringler saying, Broken was the peace then, wind the hurtling javelin hail around the serpent. Forward they followed Eric in the slaughterous fray, say they, south of the sea by Svolda, the Swedish and Danish men. 
almost Shakespearean in the way that the Heinz Kringler can be at times. And Thank you. I do my best to do a dramatic reading of these things. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> Then there's a couple of pages of description about the boarding of the serpent and there's an intriguing battle between uh, these two archers where they're commanding orders to shoot arrows at certain people and things and them hitting the masts and everything. There's a lot of detail, so do find it in the Heimskringler if you want to read some slightly exaggerated Viking sea battles. But eventually, Eric Håkonsson storms the Norwegian king's boat himself, and the saga says that Eric boarded with 14 other Vikings, but Olaf Tryggvason's brother-in-law fell upon them, forcing them back to their own ship. And then there was some more skirmishing at range with some arrows and javelins, slowly picking off the Norwegians until there were more gaps in the defence of the serpent, letting Eric's men once again on board. And King Olaf and his marshal, his sort of like military leader, retreated with the surviving Vikings to the aft of the ship before they were surrounded. And the two men, rather than being captured, decided to dive into the sea, thinking that that would kill them and, you know, they wouldn't be able to be paraded in a victory parade. But his marshal was actually captured alive and taken before Earl Eric Hawkinson, who actually spared him, which was quite nice. However, Olaf Tryggvason was never seen of again, and the battle was over. Oh, well, was he never seen of again? The Heimskringla actually says that even then, there were rumours that the king maybe cast off his armour and managed to dive out of sight of the warships and escape. There are then other accounts in different sagas that recount rumours that Olaf Tryggvason was spotted in Rome, in Jerusalem, and elsewhere around the Mediterranean. So it's a bit like Hitler ending up in Argentina after the Second World War. <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. No other similarities, though. I just find that bit, well, you know, I've, you read it and you're like, Excuse me? What do you say happened? One minute he's supposedly on a ship in Öresund or off the coast of Germany, and then the next, hey presto, he's hanging out in Rome. What happened there? I, I have this mental image of him standing on his ship and then just going, actually, forget about this, this is going tits up, I'm off to Rome, and then just jump off the edge and swim all the way to Italy. Probably not what happened. No, I think that's definitely something that has been exaggerated in the annals of history. In fact, more sources claim that Olaf Tryggvason just plain died at the Battle of Svolda, but that's not as fun to imagine as these conspiracy theories. No, absolutely. But at least one thing we do know for certain is that Olaf Tryggvason never returns to become king of Norway again. Um, maybe spending time in on holiday in Italy or something. <laughs> but um, the victors then pretty much split Norway between them. Sven Forkbeard, now much more focused on heading west to England on uh, his many more adventures that unfortunately we won't be able to cover too much. But he again installs vassal kings in Norway to rule for him, just like the Danes have been doing for years now and his puppet king becomes Eric Hawkinson who managed to take up the position his late father had years before along with his brother so they got to share power for a bit. That's nice. Yes and more relevant for us Olaf Hawkinson received four districts in Trondheim as well as Mura, Romsdal and Ronrika which are sort of areas in central to northern Norway. That is really impressive, right? Not only is Ulof Hörtkönung probably the first person to truly unite the ruling of many kingdoms around Sweden, but now he also has a huge chunk of central Norway. He gave these to his son-in-law, Jarl Svein Helkonsson, who would rule these for him as his vassal. So once again, Norway is ruled by vassal kings, but this time from both Denmark and Sweden. This split will lead to years of animosity between the three Nordic countries, for understandable reasons, I suppose, and this lasts for many years to come. 
So overall, what we've learned from this is that Olaf Werkon is clearly keen to expand his rule and not afraid to take up arms or make alliances to do so. And it's also during Olaf's reign or just afterwards that we see the last great Viking rage take place. And this is often referred to as the Ingvar's target or Ingvar raid, as we would say in English. And Ingvar being a common first name in Swedish. It's mentioned in the Icelandic sagas and on around 25 runestones that are still around today in Sweden, which we can read for a bit more detail. We don't know exactly when this took place, but historians have been able to determine that it would have taken place sometime before 1041. So depending how far before, it could have been during Olaf's reign or a little bit afterwards. We also don't know what sort of personal ties, if any, Olaf had to the people who went on this raid or what that influence would have entailed. But what we do know is that a group of Vikings went off on a raid towards the east in a very typical style that we've seen many times over the last hundred years. This time they ended up in a place called Serkland, which was the area around the Caspian Sea. So it's really far. They pretty much crossed the whole of the European continent on rivers and waterways, carrying their boats when they had to, like we talked about in a lot of the early episodes of the Vikings going east. And these runestones that are still around today speak of how this was a difficult raid, many died, and that actually only one ship made it back to Sweden. Perhaps these difficulties of the raid contributed to making it the last major Viking style raid. We don't know. The fact that the Christian church was becoming more and more of a fact of life in Sweden around this time, that also meant that there was a move away from the east and towards the community of Christianity that was in Western Europe. What had once been connections and alliances in the East became foes and alien because they weren't part of this new Christian club. Perhaps it was a combination of both and the fact that the times had moved on, that society was changing, the age of the Viking raids was simply over in that cyclical way that our world always changes. But it's interesting to see that Ulof Hötkonung might have reigned during the last of the major Swedish Viking raids, but he also reigned when the first of something very important in Swedish history happened, namely what? He became the first Swedish king to make coins. Very exciting. And this is very much his claim to fame in Swedish history, or at least the first part of his claim to fame, and we'll get to the second one a bit later on. Olof actually begins making coins the first year of his reign in 995 in the town of Sigtuna, the town that his father Erik Sägersel founded during his reign, and that is now becoming the new centre of power, replacing Birka in its importance. There are around a hundred of these coins left in museums and collections around the world today. Jonas Roos has written an article about these coins in the Journal of Swedish Antiquarian Research. And it's in Swedish, which is unfortunate for most of our listeners, but it is out there if you are interested. The coins are around 22 millimeters in diameter, and they have the king's face on one side and a cross on the other. Around the portrait, in Latin script, not in runes, First it says Rex and Situna, and then later coins say Rex Svevorium. So that would be first king in Sigtuna, and then king of the Svear, one of these large tribes of Sweden. This is something that Jonas Rius highlights as being quite important for our discussion about Olof as the first king of all the Swedes, that his coins, the first coins, just mentions Sigtuna as his area of reign, but then later on, unfortunately we don't know when, it expands to be the king of Svear. Presumably it's quite soon after though, as he is seen as the king of Sweden in the sagas at the Battle of Svolda in the year 1000. Either way, to make these coins, Olof needs coin makers, minters as they're called. 
Because you can't just rock up and decide one day, I'm going to make coins because I don't know how you would start making coins. I could guess, but it's probably going to go really wrong. Yeah, and for obvious reasons, there were no coin makers in Sweden because, well, we hadn't had coins before. So, of course, there's no one that knows how to make them. Instead, Olof gets minters from York in England to come over and make these coins. And... These English minters then train Swedish minters and they make stamps to be used to mass produce several of the same kind of coins. The coins made in Sigtuna usually have a mix of Latin letters and rune writing on them. So we see that mix of influence from England and from Sweden. I can just imagine some sick tuna school of minting in sort of 999 where these late 20s Swedes are sitting there at these desks learning from these English minters and can't really understand what they're saying. <laughs> it's perhaps not surprising that the minters come from England because this is very much indicative of the increased trade with the British Isles that Sweden would have had at this time and people they would have needed to get easy access to to help them start making coins. In Britain, coins have been used for a very, very long time since the Roman invasion or before that. So they've been around for ages. So there's presumably a good horde of experts out there willing to earn a bit more money themselves by teaching others how to make money. Yeah, come over to Sweden, teach the Swedes how to make coins. Yeah, it's a good holiday. Um, anyway, I think it's a good time to read out a bit of Rules' article as it's very good talking about this sort of thing. And so he writes... The site of the mint was excavated in Sigtuna in 1990 and 1991 in the blockhouse known as Urmakeren. Coin production took place in a small house on a plot with three houses on it. The plots in the excavated area have been interpreted as part of a great number of plots owned by the crown. Those who used them probably belonged to or were employed by the king. The early coins may have been used for payment to soldiers and persons employed and attached to the king for domestic and foreign trade, for taxes, rents and fines. When the English moneyers Godwin, Leofman, Snelling and Ulf Katil were in Sigtuna, they oversaw the production of the coins. The king probably had a bailiff in Sigtuna. When the English moneyers had left Sigtuna, the bailiff probably oversaw the mint. And I just love the fact that these English minters we know their names, Godwin and Ulf Kettle. It's starting to become very real history, very tangible evidence of people's existence. But anyway, the fact that Olof Hjöldkjönung was the first Swedish ruler to make coins is important for two reasons. Firstly, because it shows a change in society the people that Sweden wanted to trade with, they no longer wanted to use the barter system where you trade one piece of goods or services for another, like you get two pigs for a piece of fur or whatever. Instead, they wanted to use this thing called money, coins, a monetary system. That's an important change in society. Uh, move away from the old, the Viking Age in this case, towards something new, in this case, the Middle Ages. And of course, they had been to Constantinople and to Francia, where money had long been a fundamental part of their economies. So this is just one step on the road to becoming more like these major Christian countries. Indeed, and secondly, it shows Olof's power. It shows that when this new thing called money is going to be introduced, he's the one with the power to take on that process and control it. It's presumably really expensive as well. He's the one with the power to gather the natural resources to make the coins and pay people to come and help him learn how to do it. He's the one that can go to England and say, come to Sweden with me and make these coins. And he's got enough reach and power to tell the Swedish people that they're going to be using this thing called money and is going to have his political propaganda all over it in pictures of his face. Yeah, I'm sure that change didn't happen overnight, but still, it's a real show of power. 
It's important to state how much this shows his power. The first coins weren't issued by a local earl or just a rich merchant, but rather they were issued by the ruler himself. And it has the word rex, the Latin for king, on it. Olof's son, Arnund, who we'll get to in a bit, he continued to issue coins in Sigtuna when he was king, but after Arnund, there was actually a pause in the production of coinage for over a hundred years, until the reign of King Knut Eriksson, someone who we'll get to much later. For now, for the first time, we have a person with enough power concentrated in his own person and with a wide enough reach of his power to do something like that. It's a big change from the Hings-ish we saw a hundred or so years ago when Ansgar came to Sweden, for example, these kings that weren't accepted by everyone or only ruled a small area or didn't wield sole power but rather had to ask everyone if they agreed with them. Now we're talking a proper general ruler style king. But Chris, you said the coin making was only part of what Hörtkönung's claim to fame as a king was. What's the second? He converts to Christianity. And I know you're going to think, well, so what? That He's not the first because his dad tried that too. So he's not the first senior figure in Sweden to at least try Christianity. But the important difference between him and his father is that Olof stays Christian and really acts as a Christian king. And there's also the fact that Olof is now a proper king, whereas last week we decided that Erik wasn't. Yes, and that's an important fact because this also makes him Sweden's first truly Christian king, which, like we mentioned in the last episode about his dad, that helps when it comes to being remembered in a Christian country, which is what Sweden will become. So whilst Erik Segosel flirted with Christianity, for the lack of a better word, for a few years, and he probably did so to become more established in his rule over Christian areas in the south of Sweden and Denmark, with Olof, Christianity gets a permanent presence in the heartland of Swedish territory. Olof isn't born Christian because his dad doesn't stay Christian. Um, the traditional account of his conversion to Christianity is, as with so many events in this period, lacking in sources and somewhat contradictory, but there is some good information in there. Most sources seem to agree that he's baptised at a place called Husabi Shella, or Husabi Spring, on the shores of Lake Vernon, not far from the modern-day town of Lidköping. The sources agree he's baptised in 1008, so he's already been king for over 10 years at this point, although we don't know the first time where he actually sort of started identifying as being Christian. It's believed he's baptised by another English person, a missionary called Siegfried, and that he's baptised alongside his family. In fact, Adam of Bremen writes that he's baptised alongside his wife, two sons and several servants too. The missionary bishop in northern Germany writes at the time, Rejoice that the king of Svigerna is now Christian. Svigerna being some sort of word for Swedes or Sweden. And so his baptism does actually get noticed as a proper event outside the country as well. So that shows you he's gaining in stature even in the eyes of the foreigners. Yeah, and the fact that Olof gets baptised at Husabu, which is in Västergötland, that's also important. Because whilst his and his father's traditional seat of power is in Uppland, this indicates that he thinks it's important to also include those areas further south that they have established control over more recently. And Christianity already has a stronger foothold in Västergötland. People here are more friendly towards Christians, even those who are not Christians themselves, than they are in Uppland. This will lead to some internal conflicts, some sources say, between the more southerly regions like Västergötland that are quicker to adopt Christianity 
and the more northerly areas around Lake Mälaren and in Uppland where Christianity isn't taking hold as quickly or as firmly. Some sources also say that Ulof struggled to maintain power in these more northern areas, even if they are his traditional power base, after he becomes Christian. But this is not enough to split this new and emerging kingdom. No, he manages to stay on and there isn't anything as dramatic as a civil war or anything like that. But he doesn't stop at getting baptised, though, when it comes to his relationship with Christianity. He really does go all out, because he establishes Sweden's first bishop seat. In 1017, he establishes this seat at Skara, and installs the German priest Thurgot as the country's first ever bishop, according to Adam of Bremen. Using Thurgot as his messenger, Unof then sends a great many gifts to the Archbishop of Bremen, according to Adam. This signals not only that Olaf is serious about Christianity and implementing it around his kingdom, but also that Sweden is now ready for a certain amount of independence when it comes to Christianity. With a bishop seat of its own, Sweden can then begin to start playing its own role in religious affairs to a greater extent, even if it is still subordinate to the archbishop down in Denmark. But it's not just religious affairs, really, because at this time the church also has an influence on worldly political matters too. Yes, to us today, the first ever bishop might not seem like an important thing, but like Chris says, it is a sign that Christianity is here to stay and that the ruler wants it to be an influence on his kingdom and how it is ruled. He also wants to ensure that the nearest very influential bishop, the one in Bremen, is on his side by sending him these great many gifts. It is also interesting to note again that Iulof establishes the bishop's seat in Skara. Skara is again in Västergötland and this shows, like we said, that Christianity has a stronger hold in this area, but it's also a sign of power perhaps being shifted away from Uppland and the area around Lake Mälaren, or at least it's being shared with this area and that both regions are now under one rule, uh, since both Sigtuna and Skara are important towns at this point, even though they are traditionally in different parts of the country. Adam notes that Olaf had originally wanted to convert all his people and even destroy the temple of idols situated at Uppsala. So not only does he want to try and spread Christianity, but he's trying to remove pagan sites too. Adam relates that Olaf comes to a deal with the pagans in Uppsala as they start to get a bit angry that he's going to tear down their temple. So the deal says that he wouldn't remove the temple, but he would choose a part of Sweden he liked best to build his church there without interference from the pagans, as long as he would promise not to force Christianity onto those who didn't want it. So it's sort of a non-aggression pact, basically, between the two groups. This was the church at Skara, where Thurgot was installed as the country's first bishop. It's in the area that Adam says was partly chosen too, because it was the nearest to the Danes and Norwegians, who were further along their Christianity journey than the Swedes. But like so many of the Christian bishops who end up going to Sweden for their career, this story doesn't end too well for Thurgot personally either, because he gets leprosy and dies after being a bishop there for about 10 years or so. So it's very much like Ansgar's colleagues. Yeah, I feel like over these last hundred years that we've talked about recently in the podcast, you know, if anyone asked you, hey, do you want to go and be a missionary in Sweden? You should run for your life because they all ended up getting killed or die somehow horribly like poor Thurgot getting leprosy. That doesn't sound like fun at all. Absolutely not. And it's believed that Fergot might have been succeeded by the English monk Siegfried, the same who baptised Olaf and his family. But that's about 20 years previously at this point. So he's either was very young when he baptised him or is leading a very long and healthy, not leprosy led lifestyle. <laughs> as long as you don't get leprosy, you're good to go. Establishing the bishop's seat is one of the last major things Olaf does as a king before he dies, 
But still, before he dies, he still has time for another war with Norway. Indeed, because after holding on to Norway as a vassal state through their puppet kings, Denmark once again loses control of Norway in 1015, and a man called Olaf, again, unfortunately, manages to take control of Norway and unites the country around him, and he sets about trying to take back the territory that Olaf Hörkonung was awarded after the Battle of Svalda. In fact, this led to the story we related to in episode 18, the stories of Viking women, if you remember the story of Astrid, with the slightly confusing situation for the second time in this episode, where there are two kings who are both called Olaf. Yeah, they seemed very fond of the name Olaf at the time, but if you want a quick reminder, go back and listen to episode 18, Stories of Viking Women. So this was the story where the advisors of both Olafs were desperate for them to make peace with each other, but Olaf Hörkonung was really stubborn and wanted to continue fighting no matter what because he wanted to win, and Astrid, Olaf's daughter, ran away to Norway to marry the other Olaf as a way to end the war. So this settlement was made to end the war with Olaf II of Norway at Kungahella, and as always we're now trying to use a saga to determine what real history was, so it's difficult to assess what actually happened, but it does seem that one result of the hostilities was that the people of Jämtland and Helsingland, nowadays central Sweden, a bit north of Sigtuna, came under Swedish rule rather than the Norwegian rule. Yeah, so that's fighting more wars but then eventually making peace with Norway. That is what concludes Olof Hörtkönung's reign because eventually, after all the drama, he does finally die in the winter of 1021-1022. His son, Onund Jakob, succeeds him as king, and Adam of Bremen wrote at the time of his baptism in 1008 that Onund was, quote, a youth in respect of age, but in wisdom and piety he excelled all who were before him, nor was any of the kings as acceptable in the eyes of the Swedish people as Onund. So that's good. It is perhaps not surprising that Adam of Bremen, himself a clergyman, writes this, because Onund is very supportive of continued Christian missions in Sweden, and he himself is very Christian in his activities. So Adam of Bremen is perhaps not very objective in his, in his account of him. But much more on Arnund in future episodes. In general, the death of Olaf Hörtkonung marks a weakening of royal power for the next decades, or even next century or so, to come, as there were never really any hard and fast rules written about what kingship should be like, or anything as complicated as what the succession should look like. Arnund does continue his father's work of making coins in Sigtuna, as we mentioned earlier, but after about 1030 we don't see any more Swedish coins for quite a while. But by that time, by 1030, roughly 2 million coins have been produced in Sigtuna, which is quite staggering for a country just starting off on the minting game. We don't really know why it stops, but there's maybe there's enough to satisfy the Swedish market's needs, or maybe there's now enough foreign coins around as well, or perhaps the weak system of monarchy no longer has enough power over the locals, the church, and the raw materials to commit to such an expensive endeavour. When we cover the next five, six kings after Fuerkonung's sons, you can definitely see that that might be one of the reasons, as the monarchy really does take a step back after this mini-dynasty. Yeah, and we also have to remember that the concept of locally producing money, producing coins in Sweden, but also the idea of the value of coins in a political sense, that's still new. I guess it might have been like what happens with new inventions still today, that it gets popular for a while, then it dies down, then it comes back, sort of ebbs and flows. So we know that Iwulof's son takes over after him, but it's worth saying a few more words about his family in general, as up until now we haven't really mentioned his children or his significant others, if uh, we are to call them that. 
because it's with this family that Olof creates ties to many other rulers of the time. He has at least four children with two women. He has two of his mistress, or Afrilla, as they were called at the time, a woman called Edla, who was of Slavic descent. With her, he has a son, Ermund, who will also ascend the throne after his half-brother, Arnund, in the 1050s. In Swedish history books, Eamund has an excellent epithet because he's known as Eamund the Old or Eamund den Slema, which translates to English as Eamund the Slimy. <laughs> Bit like Jabba the Hutt. Yeah, oh, Eamund den Slema. Eamund the Slimy. <laughs> Imagine going down in history with that epithet. Like, that's just, that's just unfortunate. That really is a great name, but that isn't the only meaning of the name, no. though, luckily. <laughs> no, slimme, or slimy, then, in English. I read a bit about this because I just couldn't stop giggling when, when I was doing my research, but actually it's not that funny. It, slimy, back then, meant more sort of bad or without knowledge, so it's more like he's... Eamund the, the not so good, Eamund the n not very clever, <laughs> which I suppose also isn't a very nice epithet to go down in history with. It's the Swedish equivalent of Ethelred the Unready. A little bit, but yeah, he wasn't slimy in a greasy sense, at least. Mr. Slimy has a sister called Astrid, and this was the Astrid that went off to marry the Norwegian king Olaf in the fallout of the Norwegian-Swedish war we just mentioned. Now, Olaf doesn't just have family with his mistress, as we said, he's also married, and he's married to a woman called Estrid, who is the one who becomes known as queen. With her, Olaf has two kids, son Arnund Jakob, the future king, born around 1008, and a daughter called Ingeyad. Now, Ingeyad is interesting because she marries Yaroslav of Novgorod and Kiev, the last ruler of Kiev. In the Orthodox Russian tradition, she becomes known as Anna and is canonized as Saint Anna. Anna and King Yaroslav's daughter, so Ulof's granddaughter, then marries the very famous Norwegian king Harald Hardrada. And another one of Ulof's granddaughters marries King Henry I of France. And a third granddaughter marries a king of Hungary. So we see how through his family, Ulof creates connections to both the East and West, not focusing Sweden's alliances in one direction, but rather having children who marry rulers in the West, like the King of Norway, which is a newer alliance for the Swedes, but also marriages to the East, like with Kiev and Novgorod, which is traditionally where Swedes have had stronger ties to in the last couple of hundred years. And the fact that his kids and grandkids marry these kings is a further sign of his power or his prestige that he's built up. Because the daughter of a lowly farmer doesn't get to marry a king, and we know that all these kings have different opinions of each other, and so by marrying the granddaughter of a Swedish king, it shows you that the person who's representing Sweden at that time is worthy of that respect and the value of the alliances that this would create. Now, in that list of relatives and uh, talking about his family, we have heard some pretty extraordinary epithets. I mean, obviously most notable, Edmund the Slimy. But we should perhaps say a few words about Iulof's own epithet, Sjötkonung, because I remember that this used to confuse me when I was a kid in school, and now I've finally learnt the meaning of it. So, just like Segosiel wasn't his dad's surname, Sjötkonung isn't Olof's surname. In fact, his last name would have been Eriksson, son of Erik, because, well, he was the son of an Erik. He is just called this in a number of sources, referred to as Olof Eriksson. Originally, he would have been called Skjotkonung, 
Kjönung with an O instead of an Ö because we didn't have the Ö, this umlaut vowel that today is the last letter in the Swedish alphabet. We didn't have that letter at this time. And so skjut is an old word meaning treasure or coin. So he's Olof the coin king, which makes sense since he's the first king to make coins. That's a great name. It sounds sort of like a Mario Kart villain. We've got to go and find the coin king. <laughs> um, but why has he now got an umlaut? I don't know, actually. I couldn't find that out. Why and when the er uh came into his name. Maybe Adam of Bremen had a, a leaky pen that dropped two dots on his name and, and it changed then. <laughs> If we've got any historians of the Swedish language listening, uh, please write in and tell us when the ö uh came into the Swedish alphabet and, and when it made uh, its way into Olof Sjötkonung's name. He actually probably earned this epithet much later in history. In more contemporary sources, if he isn't called Olof Eriksson, He's called Olof the Swede, uh, probably to differentiate him from Olof Tryggvason, the king of Norway that we talked about before, since their names are so similar. It's quite disappointing he didn't have Coin King written on his coins. That would be quite cool. Uh, <laughs> but I think if the one thing we've learned from the last three episodes is that they needed a bit more variety in their names. Um, so being called Olaf Rödkonung rather than just Eriksson or Håkonsson or Arnonsson is a lot easier for us, I think. I like it too because it's a cool name, both in Swedish and in English. But it's not the best one we've heard so far, not like Forkbeard or the Slimy. Still, in this period, late Viking Age, early medieval time is prime time for cool and unusual names for the rulers. To wrap up, I thought we could read a line from a brief skaldic poem written about Olaf by Otta Svarti, who was an Icelandic poet who was actually the court poet in Sweden for a number of years for Olaf and his son. In fact, he was one of these people trying to convince him to make peace with the Norwegian king Olaf when his daughter went off to marry him in Norway. So Otta writes, the warrior defends his country. Few kings are mighty like him. The king of Sweden is excellent. Wow, that, that is very nice and succinct. But before we do say goodbye, we should probably just say we do agree with the same question we posed to his father last time, that he is the first Swedish king. So I think we should put an exclamation mark in the episode title for this week. I agree. Obviously, this is a bit of an arbitrary question and decision to make, but Olaf still has much more power than the previous rulers, and even more than his father. He's ruling over a larger, more consolidated area, making alliances with all the important local leaders, and does a lot of kingly firsts, like making the first coin, becoming the first king to be Christian, and the first Swedish king to take over loads of Norway. Exactly, and he is often considered the first Swedish king. In most history books and lists of Swedish sovereigns, he is named as the first king. It was definitely the case when I went to school, we were taught, you know, the first Swedish king, answer, Olof Sjötkonung. Now that being said, the concept of king and the kind of power they wielded was different in the late Viking period, the early medieval period, than what we think of later in history as being kings. And it's definitely very different from kings and queens and royals today. But he's still an interesting character and a powerful ruler and someone who continues this move of Sweden slowly towards a more consolidated state and a proper kingdom like those seen in England and beyond. Yeah. In the next episode, we're going to head outside again, or we've actually already done it, but we're going to play you the recordings of when we went out again last weekend. We talked about Sigtuna in both this episode and the previous episode, and next episode we'll go and see it for real. It's actually luckily quite close to us again. Yeah, it's lovely. We will be coming to you live, or, well, not live in that sense, because all our episodes are pre-recorded, but live in the sense of recorded 
at the site and we will see the physical remains of the rule of these two men that we have focused our last episodes on Erik Segersjell and Oda Fröttkonung we will see how there are still remains from their time a thousand years ago with us today so that's very exciting two spoilers there's a lot of rune stones and the main street in Sigtuna is the same street that was built a thousand years ago so we see both of those things so do listen to our next exciting episode but before that you can continue to follow us on social media we've had quite a few funny comments and uh, good interaction over the last couple of days there's been a bit of a guessing game as to where I'm from, guessing my accent when I speak Swedish. Do you want to say something now quickly to give other Swedish listeners a guess? Say something like, yesterday I went to the beach and ate some cake. Igår gick jag till stranden och åt kaka. Åt kaka. I don't think it is that difficult to guess where I'm from, that I'm from the south. We've had a few very specific suggestions. That has, I've been ex- I've been impressed by that people have pretty much been able to pinpoint the council area that I'm born in. Well, maybe we should get your grandma on next, and then that'll be a good laugh. <laughs> that would be. We we can get my grandma on when uh, we get to the sort of forties and fifties, and she can be a living history of Sweden. Mm. But that's way, way, way in the future. Until then, if you have a suggestion for a Swedish phrase of the week, please send us a message. Yes, all suggestions welcomely received. I uh, wrote one down that someone said at work the other day, which is going to be the Swedish phrase next week. So looking forward to that. And the next episode, actually, will be coming out just a few days after Christmas. So that's going to be a very exciting Christmas episode not themed but christmas timed episode for you all so do look out for that very nice until then take care hey door bye bye